Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A series and this is episode number 70. Maybe slightly disappointing since uh, last month we did episode 69, but consider that episode 70 is just episode 69 with one more willing participant. I have a handful of questions to answer today. They were all taken from the comment section of the previous Probing Paul, so if you have questions for me next month, put them down in the comment section below, including that headliner, what are my honest thoughts about cryptocurrency? Excellent! We begin with a reminder that there is a Probing Paul playlist. You can see all of the times that I have been probed, the questions I have answered, including episode 69. And although I did answer 69 questions in that episode, I forgot to show this part, uh, looking down the past history of previous Probing Pauls, so gotta kick that back into gear, along with getting the monthly Q&A back to being monthly. To that end, let's start with our first question from John Easterling. I'm incredibly interested in your take on cryptocurrency. Definitely agree that GPU mining isn't sustainable as a means of maintaining scarcity. It's been on my mind for a while, and it sounds like you might have done some of the thinking for me. When or where might we see this? I have a lot of thoughts on cryptocurrency, and I think at some point I'd like to put together a well-researched video sort of explaining the topic for people who have no idea what cryptocurrency is. But for right now, I've sort of been holding off on that, so today I can share some of my thoughts on the subject, but bear in mind that this is mostly off-the-cuff stuff. And part of the reason I haven't done more of a deep dive on the topic is that my opinion is somewhat tainted on this subject. Just as you hopefully wouldn't take advice from someone who's like a self-proclaimed crypto bro on social media with like .eth in their Twitter handle or something like that, who's all about NFTs because they clearly have a vested interest in making sure your opinion of cryptocurrency is positive because just like many stocks and commodities that are traded, public opinion of something can actually impact the price. And in particular with stuff like NFTs, people thinking that NFTs have value is what gives them value, which to me is not a good means of injecting value into something. But I feel like I'm getting a bit too into the weeds already. Let's dial it back to sort of the basic principles of what might make cryptocurrency good. For the people who are advocates of cryptocurrency, what are the objective reasons why they might say cryptocurrency is better than fiat currency or something that's like the gold standard like the US used to be on? To my mind, the value proposition of cryptocurrency is a matter of fairness and accessibility. And if you look at the way a lot of existing currencies in the world work, there's a lot of criticism that there are existing establishments establishments or basically people who already have a lot of that money who use their position or their influence or their control to some degree over that currency to manipulate it in ways that you or I as a normal person wouldn't be able to do. One of the base principles of cryptocurrency is that it's decentralized. And I think the idea there is that if you can create a functional digital currency that can be traded around the world via consensus mechanisms and all of the underlying technology and how cryptocurrency works, it will operate based on the rules of its underlying design and those rules should be fundamentally impossible to manipulate by a third party or someone who might wish to exert control over the market for their own financial gain, which is something that can be pretty rampant with existing financial markets people are incentivized to make themselves as much money as possible. So from that sort of high level conceptual view, you can see how for a lot of people, cryptocurrency has value if it is able to stave off the corrupting factors that so many other currencies that exist in the world are beholden to. That said, the consensus mechanism for the top two cryptocurrencies right now, which are Bitcoin and Ethereum, if you go by market cap, are still proof of work. And if you go back in time far enough, proof of work probably sounded like a pretty reasonable means to create scarcity with something like a digital currency. In order to get more crypto, you need to mine with a CPU or then with GPUs or then with Bitcoin it turned to ASICs. But I think it's pretty evident at this point that as these cryptocurrencies have scaled up, become more valuable, become more sought after, there have been more and more people who thought like, oh, I can spend X amount of dollars on some graphics cards and then set them to mining. And then in a few months, they're making pure profit for me while I go about my day job. And as the amount of power being used by Bitcoin and Ethereum mining operations has scaled up and up, I think a lot of people, myself included, have looked at it and thought, hey, what if we could detach this proof of work thing from cryptocurrency in general? And that's what a lot of different types of cryptocurrencies are doing now. In fact, if you look at a list of the top 20 or so cryptocurrencies by market cap, they are almost all proof of stake now rather than proof of work. The main one that is still proof of work is Bitcoin, and then there's Ethereum, which should be moving from proof of work to proof of stake sometime in Q2. I'll post a link to this page on ethereum.org down in the video's description. And a lot of people have been skeptical of the Q2 
launch of the merge. And that's with good reason. It has been pushed back and delayed many, many times. But I keep coming back to this page and I keep looking at this and making sure it, it hasn't changed. And it still hasn't changed. And it's March now. We're less than a month from at least the start of Q2 2022. Meanwhile, cryptocurrency itself continues to fluctuate in price going up and down. This is this is sort of a peculiar gap right here where it jumped from 2,500 to 2,700-ish like this morning. I don't know. I don't know why there's that gap there. Something with the reporting, I guess. Huh, same thing over here on Bitcoin. That's a bit odd. But anyway, if we look back to like a week or we go back to a month or we go back to a year, we can see that Bitcoin has fluctuated. It's gone up and down a bit. It's peaked up around these 65,000, almost, it got just shy of 69,000. Uh, but meanwhile, in the past few months, it's been fluctuating between about 35,000 and 45,000. But back to that original point about my opinion on this matter being a little bit tainted by my own personal motivations, my own contributing economic factors, you should be taking my opinion with a grain of salt, like I said, just as much as you would someone who is 100% all in for cryptocurrency. For me, it's pretty evident that the GPU shortage over the past year and a half to two years has been directly impacted by Ethereum mining profitability. Not the price of Ethereum, but the profitability, which is impacted not just by the price, but by how many people are currently mining Ethereum because the difficulty adjusts based on how many people are actually contributing. This is created a second market for graphics cards aside from PC gaming. I, of course, make videos about building gaming PCs, and that's my core business model. I say, hey guys, here's a gaming PC that you can build for, you know, $700 or $800 or some reasonable amount, and then I put links, some people can go buy the cards, and I might get some affiliate sales commission, and I get some uh, YouTube ad revenue by people watching my videos. But if people can't buy graphics cards, or if graphics cards are just stupidly overpriced because they're being bought up by Ethereum or cryptocurrency miners left and right, then it impacts the overall market for PC sales, PC component sales, and especially in 2021, it directly impacted my viewership. I made less money than I had in years prior. So I have not done any videos on like, hey guys, here's how to mine on your GPU in your spare time, or here's how I set up a mining rig with the GPUs that I have here. It's the same principle for me that applies to me owning stock in techs, like stock in AMD or Intel or Nvidia. I don't own any of that. As far as I know, I have a 401k, so I guess there might be some involved in that but I don't directly touch any of that stuff. So my opinion there isn't going to be affected to say like, oh guys, this new AMD stuff is really great because I own AMD stock and I want it to go up. Likewise, I would prefer that PC gamers can have a market for PCs and graphics cards over here, and cryptocurrency folks can have their own thing going on over here, and we can discuss those two things separately so that I can objectively determine the merits or shortcomings of something that is very much wrapped up in the tech world that I often dabble in. And I guess that's pretty much all I can say right now, at least sort of just talking off the top of my head. Yes, I do see merits to cryptocurrency. It's like with Luke Skywalker and his father, Anakin. He's like, I, I see, I see that there is still good in you. And maybe that is the case, but for now, I've just got my sights set on the merge, hopefully if and when that actually happens. And I really, really do think that if it does go through and happen, even if it's about to happen, even if it's leading up to it happening, I think the people who are significantly invested in cryptocurrency mining, especially with GPUs, are going to start selling off their hardware. I also think that group of people is relatively small compared to the people who are actually into cryptocurrency. So while there will be pushback from people who are invested into GPU mining, I think there's likewise a lot of people who are like, I'd like to see how cryptocurrency can be addressed by the world without the specter of the economic impact or its impact on PC gaming and people's ability to just buy a graphics card and have fun in their spare time. But anyway, I hope that was somewhat coherent. Thank you very much for your question, John. Let's move on to Six Shooter 14 who asks, who's asking a much simpler question about their gaming PC. They have an air-cooled i7-7700K at five gigahertz with a Z270 motherboard, an EVGA RTX 3070, and a 16 gig DDR4 2133 memory kits. And he's asking if upgrading his memory might help his aging platform out with some newer games and some video editing. I think, yes, absolutely, uh, you should you should try out a memory upgrade because, uh, well, a few different reasons. For one, your memory is running at a speed that is okay, but there's definitely DDR4 that can run faster. And a 7700K should be able to do 2400 speed like with no problem at all. Like, that's an officially supported speed by Intel. And with the right kit, you should be able to hit 2800, 2933, maybe even 3000 plus. And chances are, since you built your system, memory prices have come down. You can also upgrade your capacity going from a two 
two by eight gig kit to two by 16 gigs. You might be tempted to try to get the same kit that you already have and drop in two more sticks just to increase your capacity, but I'd actually recommend going for a two by 16 gig kit with just two dims, especially if you're thinking about running at a higher speed because more memory modules populated, like a four slot configuration with all four slots populated will be more challenging to run higher speeds than just a two slot configuration. But just taking a quick look at DDR4 uh, memory kits here on PC Part Picker, I'm looking at 32 gig kits between 2666 and 3200 speed. And depending on the cast latency you go with, yeah, like around 100 to maybe 115, $120, lots of kits available. You can double check specific kits and see if anyone has tried them out with a 7700K and gotten the XMP values to post. If you're not comfortable with memory overclocking and messing with timings and stuff like that, I'd recommend something like a DDR4 3000 kit, simply because that might be easier to plug in the XMP values and run at the rated speed versus a higher specs kit that might present some incompatibility. But yeah, because you have a faster graphics card, a pretty uh, recent model graphics card, you should get a little bit more performance out of that. It won't be night and day, but it might bump up two, three, four, maybe even 5% uh, FPS, depending on what game you're playing in the resolution. And also, like I said, going to 32 gigs is going to be a big step up for you when it comes to video editing. That said, you will eventually want to upgrade this platform because you're still running a quad core uh, CPU and quad cores are they're getting more and more outdated. So I think that's the decision you should make right now. Should you drop 100 to 120 ish dollars on a DDR4 memory upgrade and see what kind of performance it gets you? Or should you hold off on that and wait till maybe later this year because both Intel and AMD are moving over to the DDR5 standard. And if you do want to upgrade your entire system and get a CPU with more cores and threads, which would be very good for video encoding or transcoding or if you render out proxies before you edit, for example, then that might be the way to go for you. But hopefully I have helped you make that decision and thank you for your question. Next up, Tassadar Fourier. If we're militantly against Windows 11, would you still recommend getting 12th gen, Intel 12th gen at all? And that's specifically because Intel 12th gen CPUs have P cores, performance cores, and E cores, efficiency cores, and Windows 11 is the only operating system that is currently fully enabled to recognize those different types of cores and assign tasks to them based on the task. But yeah, should you should you get 12th gen at all? Should you just do the 12400 that has no E cores, which would negate that problem? Should you just get an 11th gen or an AMD CPU? Should you turn off the E cores? Or should you just use 12th gen normally with Windows 10? So first off, there's a TechSpot article linked in the description, which is a Windows 10 versus Windows 11 performance testing that Steve over at Hardware Unboxed did. One thing I will say is that if you need VBS, virtualization-based security, uh, which you may or may not need, chances are you don't need that. But if you do, then you absolutely should be running Windows 11 with Intel 12th gen. If you don't need that, then the difference between Windows 11 and Windows 10, at least in terms of gaming, is pretty minor. Yes, Windows 10 is a little bit slower, but it wasn't that huge of a difference. And like I said, with CPU compute tasks, uh, the big hit was when you use VBS with Windows 11. Uh, other than that, Windows 10 and Windows 11 are pretty comparable. I would kind of ask why you are militantly against Windows 11. Yes, it did have some hiccups upon launch, which new operating systems often have, but I haven't found it to be too egregious in terms of daily use. I think it just boils down to, do you want to get the maximum performance out of the hardware that you're using? If you are, and you want to get 12th gen, then yes, I would say you should just bite the bullet and use Windows 11. If not, then you're gonna be giving up some performance no matter what way you go, whether you're just buying a lower ranked processor like the 12400 out of the gate, or if you're doing something like disabling eCores, I'd say using it with Windows 10 is probably gonna be the most reasonable mid-range solution, or like you also said, just get an AMD CPU. Next we have Black Cobalts. Uh, thanks for answering my question. You're welcome. I answered one of theirs in Probing Paul 69. One for the next episode with uh, all the advances in AI and robotics, what purpose would be their best use? So I'm gonna come at this from kind of a conceptual standpoint and I apologize if I offend any of your sensibilities because to my mind, there's a problem with binary thinking. Or you could also say binary thinking has led to a lot of the problems that exist in the world today. A system that probably most of us are entrenched in to some degree is capitalism. And I don't want this to be a debate about the upsides or the downsides sides to capitalism, but capitalism is, is often very much about min-maxing. You want to minimize your expenses and maximize your profits. All that is to say, I feel like min-maxing in a corporate environment can often lead to, yes, maybe more profits for the business and maybe more money for the people who are running the show, but often just a crappier working experience for most of the people who are actually doing the heavy lifting. But the reason I even reference that at all is because I feel like what AI 
AI is most often used for is for modeling and taking a model and running simulations over and over and over again to try to figure out the most efficient way to do something or the best way to do something. But AI training is based on inputs. Uh, AI has to be fed information and told like, here is what our goal is. And then AI will try to figure it out and work towards that goal. I'm speaking at a very high level, but that's because I don't do any AI programming myself. And to bring this back around to an answer for you, I would like to see AI models trained with a goal that is not necessarily making the most money for the company that's in question. Perhaps AI could be trained with a goal of making life just generally better for as many people as possible, for increasing general human happiness, for establishing and maintaining reasonable work-life balance so people can put in a reasonable amount of work and make enough money to live their lives and still raise a family or do whatever else brings them joy. I see great potential for that, but I also see uh, a lot of reason to be maybe not as optimistic about that. Because like I said, the training models for these are often geared towards just making as much money as possible or keeping viewer retention on a page as long as possible. And that I think with the prevalence of social media has fed to a lot of the underlying issues in society right now. But honestly, this is the kind of question that leads into subject matter that uh, is maybe a bit too broad for what I usually discuss on Probing Paul. So I'll leave it at that. Next we have James from Wellington who says, Hey Paul, uh, for Hero, that's our dog Hero, looking to Antonol, it's high concentration green lip muscle extract. Their doggy was put on it uh, by their vets. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's made a big difference. Here it is. I'll have to figure out if we can get this on Chewy or if we're going to order it directly, but we're going to get some of this. We're going to try it out, and uh, if it helps here out, thank you very, very much for the question and the recommendation. Here is a big old comment slash question from Jack Lind. I am not going to read the entire thing right now because it's fairly long, but it's very uh, thoughtful, and I appreciate it, Jack, very much. Uh, number three down here is the main thing I, I wanted to reference. Uh, this is about my daughter, Hannah, and I talked in the last video about how I don't actively try to, you know, post pictures of her on social media all the time or f figure out ways to shoehorn her into my videos because honestly I want her to live her life as a two and a half three-year-old right now and not be worried about stuff uh, of her that was posted on the internet before she was even old enough to know what the internet is. Instead I love this suggestion down at the bottom. On each birthday sit down and write your daughter a letter. Give these letters to her at either her 18th birthday or high school graduation so she has a snapshot of what you're thinking and feeling each year as she grows up. That's brilliant Jack. That's beautiful. Actually one of the things I've been thinking about recently is, is like those videos you see of, of the parent who took a picture of their child every Every single day from when they were like two to when they graduated or something and then they did this massive time-lapse video and I have not done anything like that but this is a great idea and uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to do it. Her birthday is not till May but I'm gonna try to get a list of questions down that we can like ask her repeatedly every year and see how the answers change. Next question from AZ Motorhead. Love your channel. I'm glad to hear things are improving for you. Thank you very much. Inquiring minds want to know what would you do if you won the lottery? So first off, I never buy lottery tickets. I just don't. I've never thought it was a worthwhile way to spend my money. So the chances of this happening are slim to none. But if I did still somehow happen to win the lottery, first of all, I would tell no one. You would have no idea. I would not, I would, I would tell zero people. If there's anything I've learned from reading anecdotal stories of other people who have won the lottery, uh, it's, it's you should keep it from as many people as you possibly can. Beyond that, I would probably do like boring practical things with it, like paying off our house or paying off my parents' house, paying off any outstanding debt in general, and then trying to find a reasonable plan for like, you know, what money we make now, how much we want to have to spend each year, and then probably a lot of research into various charities to figure out like the most effective way to donate as much of the money as possible in a way that it would also be put to really good use. But yeah, that's what I would do if I won the lottery. Uh, finally, uh, we have a question from Nefanor, who has a very accurate profile picture as an alien and an expert in probing. I appreciate you letting us probe you so often. You are a good human. Uh, and you know, I appreciate, uh, you know, I never get to see the probers like face to face. I'm generally under some heavy form of anesthesia by that point, but it's nice to know that, uh, you know, I appreciate being probed and they appreciate probing me as well, as hopefully you do too. But that's all for this video, you guys. If you enjoyed it, you can leave me a comment in the comment section down below. Ask me a question and maybe I will answer it in the next episode of Probing Paul. You can also hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video. There are some links in the description to stuff I talked about today. Also, there's a link to my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, beer sets, and yes, my beer glasses can also be used for water. Other than that, consider subscribing if you're not already. Thank you very much again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.